uh, welcome to the Claremont Institute's annual Constitution Day um, gathering and seminar. Obviously, this year we're, we're doing it remotely. I had to change it up a bit for the topic of this first panel, uh, COVID and the Constitution. Uh, before I introduce everyone, I just want to thank you all for joining us again and, and uh, recognize some of the supporters of Claremont who make this event and the rest of our annual events possible. Uh, we have a couple of 2020 Constitution Day sponsors, even though we are remote, uh, very grateful for those. Richard Christie and Gordon and Vashery Fell, thank you very much. And then our annual host committee, which supports this event and, and our annual gala and um, much else of our programming throughout the year. Uh, this is a long list, so bear with me. Uh, it's a good problem to have for it to be a long list, and we're very grateful. Uh, Thomas and Mayumi Adams Family Foundation, the Burstein Law Firm, Mark D. Carlson, MD, and Susan Carlson, uh, Richard D. Christie again, Roy Crummer, board member of the Claremont Institute, Robert and Wendy DePietro, uh, Dr. Peter Farrell, Jackie Glass and the Kling Family Foundation, Norma and Scott Granis, Michael and Cynthia Malone, uh, Michael's a new board member of ours as well, Larry Matson and Ellen Sherwood, Larry also a board member, Michael and Miriam Miller, Dr. Livia Salty Bowman, and Amy Wax and Roger B. Cohen. So thank you all very much for your support of our work and uh, thanks for joining us today. Well, with that, let me uh, introduce our panelists today. Uh, I'll just say very briefly, we wanted to talk about COVID and the Constitution because as is uh, readily apparent to everyone who's joining this call and who's been following our work, uh, we've been quite concerned with what seems to be a burgeoning semi-permanent emergency or state of emergency and sweeping with it all manner of uh, checks and balances on executive power at the state level, uh, the ability of citizens to exercise their rights, among others, the right to associate and to generally walk about freely uh, and everything else, to, to say nothing of the right to make a living. So we wanted to take up this question, which is still very urgent uh, and becomes, and has for, for odd reasons, odd, but the predictable, uh, has stratified the country uh, on a public health issue um, politically, uh, given the fact that we're in the middle of a, a fairly unprecedented presidential election, at least at the level of partisanship. Uh, maybe the 1850s uh, would be a good analog, and that's not good news. Anyway, with all that, um, I don't think I introduced myself, but I'm Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute. Everyone joining this probably knows that. And uh, to lead us off will be John Eastman. John's our founding director of the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. He's a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute, a board member. Um, he's a professor of law, the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Public Service at Chapman's Law School. And he's doing a visiting fellowship or visiting teaching uh, gig this year at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, John will lead us off. And then followed by another John, John Yu. Uh, John is a professor of law at the University of Berkeley. Uh, he teaches at our summer fellowships often. He has a long and distinguished career in the executive branch and in the legislative branch in the United States and uh, has uh, a new book out uh, about Donald Trump called Defender in Chief. I encourage you all to uh, check out John's book. And then uh, in the middle we have Ilya Shapiro. Ilya is the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Uh, Ilya is a, a frequent commenter in national venues on constitutional law and much else. And he's also, I'm proud to say, a, a Claremont Institute Lincoln Fellow alum. And then last but not least, Brian, Tom you, West. you plugged John's book. You're not going to plug my book. Oh, I, com I comes out next week. Okay. Will, will you remind us the title, please? <laughs> Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. Available for pre-order. And if you buy it, send me your address. I'm happy to send a signed book plate. You know, we can't do these in-person signings, but happy to do that. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Ilya. And my apologies. Um, and now we have Tom West batting cleanup. Tom is the Paul Ermine Potter and Don Tibbetts Potter Professor in Politics at Hillsdale College. Uh, he's taught there since 2011 after a long uh, career teaching at the University of Dallas in their graduate program and undergraduate program. He's a director as well, a board, board member uh, as, as John is, John Eastman is, and senior fellow of the Claremont Institute. And Tom, uh, like John, is, has been a fixture uh, teaching at our summer fellowships since almost the beginning. So with all that, I will uh, cede the floor to John Eastman. And uh, I just want to remind everyone, 
If you'd like to ask a question, just pull up the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type it in, and I will do my best to field all of these and announce them to the group. We got a few over email as well. So with that, John, take it away. You're muted, Eastman. <laughs> There we go. Very good. There I got it. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, and, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be on this panel. Um, I was going to try and uh, show a copy of uh, Ilya's book, but my share screen is not working. So we'll have to somebody will have to assign that to me before uh, before he gets it. It comes out on September 22nd, I think, and uh, it looks to be a very good book. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Um, so um, almost all of the legal challenges to the various uh, COVID stay-at-home orders and shutdown orders uh, have failed. Uh, there was a good one just last week out of Pennsylvania that struck down some of the orders. But I want to talk about why I think they failed and why that may have been appropriate in the early phases of this, um, but no longer appropriate. Um, so uh, the United States government, as well as every single state government, has in place statutory authority for executive officials both elected like the governor or the president and unelected like public health officials, either at the state or uh, federal level, um, to take emergency actions in response to uh, outbreaks of communicable diseases. Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act and the federal uh, statutes um, authorizes both the, health, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Center for Disease Control to take measures uh, to prevent the entry and spread of communicable diseases. And I think, I think these authorities, uh, apart from the question of the delegation of lawmaking power, which I'll get to in a minute, I think are appropriate. Um, they have the ability to block uh, entry of uh, people and goods from foreign nations uh, that might uh, contribute to the spread of a communicable disease. And that's clearly authorized under the uh, uh, foreign commerce power that Congress has in Article 1, Section 8. They have the authority to prevent uh, 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 transfers of people across state lines and goods that might contribute to spread of communicable diseases. And I think that's authorized um, under the interstate commerce power that Congress clearly has. They even, under I think bad Supreme Court precedent um, from the New Deal era, have the ability to deal locally with uh, communicable disease outbreaks if in the aggregate uh, those local activities might have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Now, our litigation center has been pushing back against that Wickard versus Filburn doctrine for a long time, but at the moment, it's a still good Supreme Court precedent. Um, President Obama uh, implemented these orders with respect to respiratory diseases back in 2014 with Executive Order 13674. So all of the T's are crossed uh, and the I's dotted in the federal level. The states also have broad police powers. Um, uh, California's Health and Safety Act, uh, Section 120175, not only authorizes, but mandates the public health officials to take whatever measures are necessary to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. Um, Colorado, where I happen to be right now, has a similar set of provisions in their uh, Disaster Emergency Act. But what's significant there is that all of those authorities are designed to allow for a prompt response to an unforeseen emergency. Emergency, an unexpected event that places life or property in danger and requires an immediate response. It allows for imminent action by executive authorities with these delegated powers. But at some point we have to question um, whether the delegated authorities have ceased to be responding to an emergency and we've now handed off the basic policy judgments, the lawmaking, the balancing of risks and benefits that is part of the lawmaking process to an unelected health official uh, or uh, an executive official that's not supposed to have lawmaking power. And I think that that transition from emergency to uh, uh, perpetual rule by executive dictate is where we are now. And I think a very viable challenge on non-delegation uh, doctrine grounds ought to be uh, vested. This is a doctrine that we don't pay much attention to in the federal constitution. It's one that's kind of buried deep, deep, deep inside the text of the constitution. It's Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, <laughs> that the lawmaking power has to be vested in Congress. And uh, similar things exist in the states that require separation of powers. Why is this important? Because we now know 
that this is not a one-sided uh, po political or policy issue. Uh, yes, we want to stop the spread of communicable diseases, but we need to weigh and balance the kinds of consequences and harms that exist on the other side. From health harms with the increase in, in uh, uh, suicide rates uh, to, environment, to environmental and economic harms, the shut down, shutting down of massive parts of the economy. All of those things are properly fodder for a legislative deliberative judgment to be made rather than mandates imposed by an executive. Um, we have several other things uh, that have been going on here as well. And I think it's important to talk about these. Uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution includes several protections that ought not to be trampled even in dealing with emergencies, the freedom of speech and assembly, um, the freedom of religion. Now, the freedom of religion at the federal level has largely been gutted. Uh, we don't give it the same kind of protection that we give the freedom of speech uh, and assembly. Uh, the issue there is whether the Supreme Court decision by uh, uh, you know, one of the conservative icons, uh, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, that he just uh, wrote nearly 30 years ago, is going to be overturned. That's an issue that the Supreme Court has taken up this coming term. Um, but they give less protection to, to uh, religious exercise than they give to these other First Amendment freedoms. Um, and we, need to, we need to address that. It became particularly acute in a case that the Supreme Court denied review in uh, out of Nevada. Uh, where the casinos were allowed to open with, with uh, thousands of people, 50% uh, capacity, uh, no matter how large the casino was. Uh, but churches were not allowed to open with any more than 50 people, no matter how large the sanctuary was and, and the ability to socially distance congregants inside the church. That blatant discrimination in favor of casinos over, over religious assemblies uh, should have provoked a Supreme Court response, uh, and yet it did not. Um, there are a number of other issues that I think um, uh, we, we, we want to look at. For example, in California, uh, a number of jurisdictions immediately tried to close down gun shops uh, as, as uh, classified them as non-essential business services. Um, uh, th those were immediately challenged, and some of the jurisdictions, like the Los Angeles County Sheriff, backed away. Uh, but the federal government preempted all of that fight by saying, by defining gun shops as essential businesses. And under our federal system, the federal law, the Constitution is supreme over these state laws. Uh, so that made those Second Amendment cases go away. Um, we also are increasingly getting uh, arbitrary uh, decisions out of these elected officials or unelected health officials. I remember when we were doing the Publius program earlier this summer. Um, we had a morning off and I went to try and play a round of golf at this very nice golf resort we'd had to had to shift our Publius program to in order to to, to conduct it in person and they were they were unable to rent me a set of golf clubs because of the governor's order now I'd come from a grocery store where I touched the metal shafts of the of the grocery carts that had been touched by a thousand people uh, over the prior week undoubtedly um, but I couldn't touch the golf club shaft that had probably been sitting in a closet for months that kind of arbitrary order seems to me um, to require some pushback by a free people. And we're starting to see that right now. Um, so I will stop there uh, and, and pass it off to John Yu. Uh, but I do think, uh, just in, in kind of summary, what may have been legitimate exercises of emergency powers at the outset of this, before we knew a lot of the information we now know, turn out to be very constitutionally troubling as time goes on. And yet we've seemed to have now allowed our governors and our unelected public health officials to decide basic policy judgments for us uh, just with the stroke of a pen without any legislative input, which means without any citizen input because the legislators are our representatives who are supposed to be tackling policy issues. That's troubling to me and I'm looking forward to American pushback as it seems to be starting to swell uh, to restore some semblance of separation of powers uh, as we deal with this crisis. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Claire Minus, too, for inviting me to participate on this uh, important day, Constitution Day. It's uh, been great to uh, be sort of, I uh, think, for Claremont programs uh, over the summer, the uh, in-house loyal opposition. And I'm going to try to play that role today. Um, but I'm really uh, grateful for uh, to Ryan and his leadership, uh, uh, the Institute. Uh, it's a great testament. You have so many people here, over 160 members. Um, gosh, you could have your own law school with that many people. 
um, joining us. And it's great to be with my friend, um, uh, John Eastman. Um, I'm glad to see he's safely on the ground. You may know that he's trying to get his pilot's license, which I think is a hazard to life both down here on Earth and to those up in the sky. So I'm glad he's not flying right now. It's also great to be here with Ilya, who as always outdresses me being the good Russian that he is. And it's great to be with Tom. I'm right in the middle of Tom's book, uh, Defending the Founders, which has been really great. Because he wrote two versions. He wrote like a popular version, I think, which I read back in the day. And now I'm writing the scholarly version. And I'm trying to see which things he changed from version one to version two. It's, it's, I'm right in the middle of it. So great. It's really a great book. So it's such a great pleasure to be on this panel with all of them. And I hope all of you uh, leave the program today reinvigorated by your desire to give the Claremont is to more and more money because they are really the bang for the buck, I think, amongst public interest and think tanks right now. Uh, so I agree with John on a lot of the points he made. I think my main difference would be how it should be enforced. What institutions should participate in reviewing uh, when it's time to end emergency, when it's, uh, which institutions should review the basis for the emergency measures. Um, uh, first, when it comes to federal versus state, I actually think the federal government right now is playing the constitutional role that's set out in a way that has presidents might not have. So you might see that the uh, wa uh, president in Washington has not tried to dictate when all the businesses in the country should shut down. He's not really tried to dictate when they should reopen. He's not tried to impose a mask mandate. Uh, the federal government instead has played the role, I think, that's set out in the Constitution, this kind of uh, role as a backstop, limited primarily to providing funds through the spending power, uh, spending the money in ways uh, that support the states, but it's the states that are, I think, under our Constitution have the primary role to protect public health and safety. So the federal government, I think, is actually, unlike uh, past emergencies, uh, past um, crises has actually played, I think, a relatively modest role as, the, uh, as uh, intended by the founders. So here's really the states that we're talking about and the state's uh, use of their powers to lock down the economy, to carry out uh, public health measures. Um, I think one thing to make clear is that the states have what's called the police power. They have the right to issue whatever rules and regulations they choose uh, on the people and property within their boundaries. Uh, the only limit on it is uh, the Bill of Rights and the individual liberties are set out in their state constitutions. Um, I should say the Bill of Rights and the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, you'll notice the state constitutions, there usually is no enumeration of powers the way there is with our federal constitution because the state government is just assumed to have all the power that a government has. And so I quite agree with uh, John that at some, you would expect states to use the police power vigorously at the beginning of an emergency. Some states did well, some states did not. That's the outcome of our federal system. Uh, and that over time, as emergencies recede, uh, you'd want uh, the government at least to take a step back and look and see whether those measures were necessary or not. I think we're, and I, and I agree uh, with, I think, the Claremont Institute's basic view that the individual liberties that should be protected are not just ones recognized in the Bill of Rights, not just ones created by statute, but that the founders uh, certainly believed in natural law. Um, you know, where I, do, where I argue with the, federal, uh, with, sorry, with the Claremont Institute is, uh, should that natural law uh, understanding of rights, should the natural rights um, that inform the Constitution, are they relevant for interpretation because they have this independent continuing force till today? Or uh, my view is, is it because that is what the founders who wrote the Constitution understood to be individual rights? And so those understandings are the context we use to interpret the text of the Constitution. So I always ask, suppose we think, for example, that a natural right back in 1787 did not include the right to practice an occupation free of unreasonable regulation. Maybe people who've worked on natural rights as a legal philosophy think that's part of the natural rights today. Do federal courts have to enforce right, that natural right of today against these lockdowns? 
or are judges limited more to the understanding of natural rights as existed in 1787, 1791 with the Bill of Rights, or 1866 to 68 through the Reconstruction Amendments? Um, and that uh, leads me to the really the main difference I would have with John, which is uh, if you think, and I, I share the belief as a policy matter that these emergency measures that the states have outlived their usefulness in terms of their draconian shutdowns of the economy, um, their rigid restrictions on travel and social life, which institution should review it? So I think I infer from John the view and, and his work, great, great work at the Constitutional Jurisprudence Center is that it should be courts. Uh, I think this was something that our courts tried already uh, during the Lochner period. And many conservatives turned away from that in the end. <laughs> Ilya's book, every book from, for Ilya writes should be called Lochner Volume 1, Lochner Volume 2. You're just reading Lochner Volume 3. It doesn't matter what the actual title is. <laughs> and oh, well, I love him for it, too. Uh, but this Lochner period, many conservatives like uh, uh, Bork, Justice Judge Bork, Justice Scalia, turned away from Lochner because it was so hard for courts to figure out a way to identify natural rights and then to enforce them against economic regulation in a way that did not seem like importing personal preferences into the Constitution. And so right, the criticism is if you oppose the judicial creativity that you see in places like Roe versus Wade or the gay marriage cases, do you want to however, allow course that kind of role when it comes to economic liberties. So instead, I would say, why not rely on the political process? Why not allow and demand that the state legislatures contain their governors? I'll point out just California, which is, you know, I live here, uh, unfortunately. I mean, strangely, my sky is not a reddish orange today. Uh, I'd be happy to share, as many of you probably saw, the pictures outside our windows just a few days ago that um, was, uh, my, the view outside my house a few days ago. Uh, I couldn't think of a better image to express what's going on in California. Um, I would say it was Dante's Inferno, but my students would probably think that was the latest bar they had to go to in downtown Berkeley. Um, okay, enough scaring everybody, including uh, myself. Um, if you look at California, it's interesting. If there's an emergency, and I think as John said, the pandemic was an emergency, the governor uh, under statutes passed by the legislature is vested with the entire police power of the state. It is an incredible grant of power. Enormous. This is uh, probably greater than anything any federal statute does with the president. All the power of government is transferred to the governor at the state level in California. But unlike federal laws about emergency, uh, the state legislature has the authority to terminate the emergency. And so the question I would just leave you with, and, then, and I'll stop now, is do you want to have the courts uh, sort of reviewing uh, measure by measure the uh, rational basis for um, an emergency and the measures, the steps taken? Or why don't we demand through the political process that the state legislature do its job? It's quite easy for the state legislature to stop the state of emergency and remove the governor's authority to issue all of these guidelines. Or the legislature can put them into uh, right into law, they can codify them. But when we turn so f quickly to the courts, I think we um, sort of, we deprive actually the political process of robustness and we become, I think, politically lazy in not organizing and demanding that our rep elected representatives do their job. Uh, thanks very much for being with me. I look forward to the discussion and comments. Great, thanks, John. Uh, Ilya, you want to take us away? Sure, thanks uh, so much uh, for having me, uh, Ryan. Uh, I remember fondly my time as a Lincoln Fellow five years ago now, uh, shooting Tommy guns with John Yu was a particular highlight, um, and working on legal briefs. I, I remember one morning I got excused from the session because John Eastman and I were working on a, on a brief together, I think, which is the, the best and probably only excuse they would have accepted. Um, uh, I also appreciate, uh, uh, you know, John Yu was making a joke about my Russian background. Well, I, I talked about how my solution to, uh, or at least my prophylactic for 
uh, COVID is to eat a lot of kimchi, the reference to his Korean background. And I find, you know, one of those symptoms is losing your sense of taste and smell. And so my entire family, because I consume kimchi, knows immediately, uh, so far we've been, you know, knock on wood, we've been fine, but we have not lost our sense of, of but, smell. But of course we know never trust Russian prophylactics. <laughs> I, I'm going to leave that there. I'm not touching that. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and to follow up on, on something that, that, uh, that John or even Ryan said before that, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, thank you for donating to the valuable institution that Claremont is. Make sure that after you've exhausted all of your donations to the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at Cato, that any remainder definitely uh, go to, uh, to Claremont. Um, so I was going to talk about mostly the state police power. I just have a paper out and Cato has a series on COVID policy or pandemic policy, whole host of areas. I commend you to that. It's, it's, uh, you, can link, you can get to it from the front page uh, of Cato's website. Um, but John, you provoked me because he asked the very important question. Uh, whatever rights we have, which I'll hopefully get into, whatever powers uh, states have, localities have, who gets to judge? And the answer is very simple. It's judges, because that's what they're paid for. And if you don't like the answers that they give you, then change them or battle over the interpretive theory that they're supposed to apply. I think we've gotten, uh, by we, I mean the conservative legal movement, has gotten uh, into a dead end uh, by its response to the excesses of the Warren court by saying, uh, uh, you know, judges should be restrained. And the, the response to activism, making it up as you go along out of whole cloth, is to sit on your hands and not judge. That's an error. Because what really uh, Bork uh, and, and others of that era, and we're sort of unlearning that now, uh, should have done is said that theory of the Constitution is wrong. Here is a better theory. And I tell you what, now when these things are focus grouped and people are, uh, you know, uh, presented with different theories of constitutional and statutory interpretation, uh, the one that's identified with originalism and textualism, forget the labels, tends to win out. This is why Joe Biden is not talking about judges. That and his kind of uh, 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 checkered history as chairman of the Judiciary Committee. I had a, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a, a, a week ago about that. Uh, and that's why it's, this has been a winning issue for the, the judges issue for, for Republicans. Now, of course, there are debates, again, about how to interpret that theory. And that's, that's uh, a, a good one uh, to have. Um, if you don't like the way that uh, a judge interprets your economic liberties, it's not a matter of natural rights. It's not a matter of abstract philosophy. It's uh, understanding what the enactors of the 14th Amendment were talking about when they mentioned in so many words the right to earn a living and, and, and other uh, issues. Okay, so enough with the, with the rebuttal. Let's go with my uh, affirmative case. Uh, and what's interesting here is I, th I don't think it was talked uh, enough about uh, how much this is a state issue. It's, it's kind of funny that President Trump has been attacked both for being a dictator and not being enough of a dictator. Uh, and it's interesting in this scenario how um, the federal government really has respected the limitations on its own power. I mean, there's not much other than running the CDC, which is a whole other host of, of problems. You know, could have closed airports, didn't, didn't need to. You know, people stopped going to restaurants, people stopped going to airports before there were official uh, orders. Or the Defense Production Act, which is really, it sounds ominous, like go, go produce this thing that you otherwise wouldn't have been producing. No, uh, if 3M is capable of making ventilators, I will give you a market rate contract to make the ventilators for where it's needed as a country. It's a perfectly reasonable thing. And I should say, my wife, uh, uh, who is now at the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, was working on all sorts of uh, these executive actions with the Defense Production Act and otherwise. And so it's funny, she would send in her comments and then the next day I would be talking about it uh, in the media and we had uh, an interesting dinner conversation all afterwards. There were no uh, uh, securities being breached. But okay, um, if the federal power is, is limited by the enumeration of those powers in our constitution, which should be adjudged by judges whether uh, the government is going beyond its powers, State police powers have long been recognized to include the authority to make laws for public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Indeed, most lawmaking in the United States is done at the state level and relies on that kind of authority. Um, the federal government simply does not possess that kind of power, and the 10th Amendment restates that arrangement. The power is not delegated 
to the United States, nor prohibited by it, by the Constitution, to the states, are reserved to the states or to the people. State constitutions, meanwhile, and those are important as well. I commend to you Jeff, uh, Judge Jeff Sutton's book on 51 Imperfect Solutions about state constitutions, uh, can be considered documents of limitation rather than documents granting powers. As John, you said, generally the, there's not a power uh, enumeration. It's just assumed that you have this background uh, police power. The COVID-19 pandemic is testing those implicit limits, uh, but states can still uh, respond effectively and responsibly. So exercises of the state police power, first of all, have to respect individual rights guaranteed in the federal constitution, while also not intruding on regulatory areas where, where federal law is supreme. So for example, a state can't do away with search warrants or regulate interstate commerce in the name of health and safety. During the first month of the pandemic, shutdown orders and other broad restrictions had a wide berth, constitutionally speaking. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Courts will rarely find that state public health officials have overstepped uh, their bounds. But measures that are reasonable in the rapid response at the start of an emergent crisis with a lack of epidemiological data will prove unreasonable once we have a better understanding of the challenges. And that's why you need judges to look at whether there is a rational basis. Does this pass? the constitutional uh, smell test. Even pandemic-related uh, regulations that are generally constitutional can tread on individual rights. This is what John Eastman was talking about with uh, the Supreme Court choosing not to block the Nevada order, for example, uh, closing churches while leaving casinos open. Uh, and also the Supreme Court chose not to block California's order that churches not hold services with more than 100 people, um, uh, even if uh, other uh, similarly situated uh, uh, businesses or, or organizations were not so um, burdened. Once New York began allowing large-scale protests, for example, its restrictions of outdoor funerals likely became untenable on equal protection grounds. Freedom of speech has also been front and center. Uh, there was an, uh, an anti-lockdown protest, I think the earliest one was in Raleigh, North Carolina, in April, that there were, there were arrests for violating the state's stay-at-home order, with the police remarking, Protesting is a non-essential activity. Well, I think that sentiment was revised nationwide in June. And again, it's up to judges to make those kind of calls. Uh, indeed, rash decisions over which workers and businesses are or are not essential have made it difficult to protect other Bill of Rights guarantees. Uh, John Eastman mentioned the Second Amendment. Several states classified gun stores as non-essential, uh, even though, again, similarly situated stores were open and gun stores could maintain the same traffic flow regulations or curbside service as, as other stores. Many states failed to classify defense attorneys as essential workers, raising Sixth Amendment right to counsel and other constitutional concerns. But the radical uncertainty that prevailed in the early months has given way to better information, sober reflection, and uh, so revision is necessary to ensure that constitutional guarantees aren't sacrificed. If grocery stores can be made safe with markings on the floor, capacity limits, and mask requirements, so can gun stores, or stores selling gardening tools for that matter. But there still may be justifications to restrict other kinds of gathering places, such as indoor movie theaters and other mass uh, attendance uh, locations. All emergency police power regulations need constant updating to protect uh, people's lives. And then there are state limits on the state's own uh, police power. The state's own constitutional structure um, uh, how limit the states, uh, whether, whether in general or the governor, the executive branch's own capacity to act. Because legislatures are slow to act and judiciaries are reactive institutions, quick responses fall to the executive branch, notably governors. But different states empower their governors in different ways. California, for example, allows its governor to declare a state of emergency in case of an epidemic, which gives the governor, quote, complete authority over all agencies of the state government and the right to exercise within the area designated all police power vested in the state. Crucially, however, the emergency declaration must be ended, quote, at the earliest possible date that conditions warrant and may be rescinded by the legislature. Um, Moving forward, if there's not already a time limit on executive emergency powers or a mechanism to override the governor's determination of a state of emergency, legislature's top priority should be in reestablishing uh, their role in recovering from, uh, from this uh, emergency. Uh, 
Fortunately, some state judiciaries are reigning in their respective executive branches. In Wisconsin, the state Supreme Court invalidated a lockdown order for failing to follow state administrative procedures. There were similar challenges in Oregon and Idaho that have met some uh, limited success. Uh, a lawsuit in Maryland failed in part, however, because the part-time legislature generally does vest and wants to a lot of discretion uh, in uh, the governor. But structural cooperation is the beginning, not the end of concerns that must be addressed when exercising the police power. New York's legislature actually amended that state's emergency power laws in early March to give the governor more flexibility. But still, New York's pandemic response is hardly the best example of an effective response that respects the rights of its citizens, particularly with respect uh, to nursing homes. So I think, um, well, I'll mention briefly local police powers, right? Because states delegate some of their police power to local municipalities. It's a different relationship than state versus federal. States and, and the federal government are both separate sovereigns, whereas localities are um, uh, political subunits uh, of the states. But still, such a decentralized approach allows an even more tailored response to a crisis than states uh, can manage. And during a pandemic that affects different populations differently, it's essential that localities have flexibility to respond to the needs of their communities. Many states, when reopening statewide, have left local decisions to their municipal counterparts, or as in my state of Virginia, uh, apply different rules to different regions. The very rural parts of the state uh, are affected differently by this pandemic than Northern Virginia, where, where I live. And so in conclusion, uh, in the early days, governors rushed to issue executive orders, mandate shutdowns, and sort people's livelihoods into essential or non-essential. They issued these responses in understandable haste, but still we can say that they generally overreacted. Uh, now that we're looking back, um, we see that many governors indeed pursued wrong strategies, even if their actions could be justified at the time by the limited information available. As our gaze turns forward, policymakers have to remember that while they have broad police powers to respond to public health emergencies, they're also limited both by the U.S. Constitution and their state's own constitutions and laws. And so they have to do their utmost to avoid abridging citizens' rights, including economic liberties. Even though the pandemic's a national problem, its impact varies by region, state, and even locality, and so requires tailored solutions that conform with our nation's commitment to individual rights and the rule of law. Thanks, Ilya. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I want to start off by thanking uh, John for the plug for my book, uh, The Political Theory of the American Founding. Political Thought of the American Founding, why is that backwards? Anyway, for me it is. Uh, but John, I, I want to use that book as my point of departure too, substantively here, because uh, the, you asked the question, what relevance does natural rights and natural law have for interpreting constitutions? And I think the answer is uh, forest and trees. It, it, if you want to know, uh, you know, this tree or that tree in the forest, look to this or that provision in, in this or that constitution. Natural rights and natural law tell you what they're for. What's the whole point of the whole of the exercise? And uh, and it's and it's going to be my argument here that we've lost sight of what constitutions and constitutionalism are all about in the current crisis. We've been, uh, we, we've been, we've been uh, uh, all of our politicians, almost all, almost all of our federal judiciary, state judiciary, they, they most all have gone along with what has been uh, the most unbelievable suspension of civil, natural, and constitutional rights ever anywhere in the Western world. Uh, I, at, least, I, at least that's how it looks to me. Uh, now, it's true that the government's not actually out shooting people and, and uh, literally confining them in concentration camps, but we have been under house arrest in most states and in most countries. If not at literally, at least in principle, we've been and we continue to be under house arrest. Most states issued those house arrest policies early on and said, uh, the only exception is when we say so. Otherwise, you are confined to your house, your quarters. The same has been true of businesses being open. Everything has been at the whim of these governors and health officials and bureaucrats. So uh, what that's the, the point of this is that that's the, the big picture is we've been deprived of our liberty and our other rights. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, the 
um, let's take three natural rights, uh, liberty, free exercise of religion and property. Uh, those both are civil rights in the US Constitution and the Michigan Constitution. Uh, Michigan, that's my state, okay, so, but most states' constitutions have similar protections of liberty in the sense of the right of freedom of association. Now, uh, what, uh, what does that mean, the right of people peaceably to assemble? Uh, people today seem to think that means vaguely the right to participate in maybe protests, public protests, um, something, you know, pro pro meetings designed to send messages to elected officials. Uh, yeah, that's one meeting, but the, not, but the most important meaning uh, is to simply the liberty to meet with other people. Uh, who share anything, common hobby, belong to a reading group, set up a school or business, all illegal, all illegal throughout America with only minimal, ex with only exceptions granted by the grace of the government. Uh, the, uh, the right to share Easter dinner, dinner with family and friends. Our governor explicitly outlawed any visits to other people's houses on Good Friday before Easter. The whole point of it, obviously, from her point of view was you deplorables, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna stick it where you'll feel it. And maybe you'll decide to finally come around and listen to mom. Um, the, the right to play with when children in a public park, the right to get together with friends and acquaintances in bars and restaurants, schools, the workplace. Uh, no one has that right under the current conditions uh, that are imposed by governments, except with these restraints that they keep putting down. Now, the newest one, the latest one, is the uglification of America through the insane masking system. And anybody who reads Alex Berenson or any of the other uh, people with some degree of sanity on this subject knows it's useless. And all it is is a point, it's virtue signaling. They're making a point of, of humiliating the public, which I think is a very important element in the entire, the entire business. But as for the freedom of association, uh, you know, this was discussed in, in the first Congress when they were just talking about the First Amendment. And the First Amendment, uh, the, in, the first, in the first Congress, Theodore Sedgwick, a Massachusetts congressman, criticized the proposed right of assembly as redundant in light of freedom of speech, unquote. He said, quote, if people converse together, they must assemble for that purpose. It is a self-evident unalienable right which the people possess. It is certainly a thing which would never be called into question. It is derogatory to the dignity of the house to descend to such minutiae, unquote. In other words, not even worth mentioning. It's just part of the right to liberty, obvious, that has to be a real, a real right. Uh, the idea, it's inconceivable to Sedgwick and to most Americans throughout our history that this liberty could be suspended, not just for a few days, I accept that idea, I, you know, immediate emergency, you don't know what to do, but for months at a time, we're now into six months. Uh, the, uh, and, and, the, and the governors are all saying, this is never, this is gonna end when we say it ends. There's no prospect of it ending until we say, and they keep changing the grounds of it, you know, the ending. Uh, it'll happen when, uh, and, and, and then of course we now hear the phrase, the new normal, which means that there's no end date on the suspension of fundamental natural rights to liberty as guaranteed in our state and federal constitutions. The second right, freedom of religion, uh, that's understood better today, I think, than freedom of association. That too has been canceled, as we have heard uh, by other from other panelists, for many Americans. Uh, and you know, again, this was not just some random right. Now, you know, the the idea that you can that it's okay to suspend freedom of religion as long as we suspend other businesses similarly situated. That seems to be the level of our debate at at the moment in terms of constitutional law. Uh, the older view, the founders' view, and many for most of American history, the view would have been. If, if, if you can't you can't use the excuse of an emergency in quotes for six months to say no one's allowed to worship in the normal way that's simply not it's not possible uh, and again uh, you have now this situation where we have we have all come to accept this as the new normal as, as a normal way of doing law and government on the, the third right the property 
uh, natural right to acquire and possess property mentioned in many of the state constitutions as well as at the federal level in many on many occasions. Uh, I've heard, of course, this is an abstract, it's not an abstract right. It's not just the right to hold on to some property you possess and keep it. It's also the right to use your property and the right to acquire property by means of selling your labor as in an employment contract and involving yourself in trade on the market. And so the founders had an elaborate set of rules in order to guarantee those rights of both possession and acquisition, such as contract law and laws governing uh, transportation to enable equal access to transportation for all citizens and so on. And, and of course, we're in a situation where businesses all over America have been shutting down by the, th by the tens and now hundreds of thousands uh, I've read I, I, that, uh, that has happened as a consequence of these rules. Uh, and uh, this is a massive change and transformation of our system. It is not a technical constitutional law problem of the scope of the police power at this point. Uh, the, um, in the Michigan constitution, there is no provision for emergency powers at all, except for cases of rebellion or invasion. There's the right of suspension of habeas corpus mentioned for rebellion or invasion. So same as the federal constitution. We don't have a rebellion, we don't have an invasion, right? We don't have, the legislature can't pass a law in the Michigan constitution delegating unlimited emergency powers to the governor, although they did so. In the, and interestingly, in the context, in 1945, during World War II, when we were all used to the idea of emergency powers being exercised for the quote, public good, unquote. We had the Japanese internment uh, going on all over the country and other kinds of emergency rules and powers being imposed that uh, were uh, characteristic of, that, of the way in which the law in that war was understood. Uh, and the, uh, you know, and I'd like to, I'd like to conclude by mentioning uh, some comments made by an Italian postmodernist leftist, Giorgio Agamben. Uh, you know, this is like, why are we getting, why do we have to get Italian leftist postmodernists to do the work Americans won't do? That's my question here. But let me quote, uh, he says, uh, and I'll paraphrase here a little to fit the American situation. He says, uh, for, for six months and with no end in sight anywhere in almost every state and every nation of the Western world, we have been accustomed to the reckless use of emergency decrees through which executive power is effectively substituted for that of the legislature, abolishing the principle of the separation of powers that defines constitutional democracy. Every precedent has been exceeded. We now learn that the sole voice of a governor or a local health official, as was once said of the words of the Fuhrer, has the immediate force of law. That's Agamben's words. It is the duty of our lawyers as Agamben and elected politicians to ensure that the rules of the constitution, of constitution are observed. They have mostly fallen silent. And he asks, Agamben asks, are we, uh, through, throughout the West, are we experiencing the end of a world, the world of constitutional democracies founded on civil rights and civil liberties, elected lawmaking bodies, and the division of powers? We have seen in this emerging new despotism that as regards the pervasiveness and controls and the cessation of all political activity, it is worse than the totalitarianisms we have known so far. You're banned from having political associations, meetings in, in person for political purposes, social purposes, except at the, uh, the discretion of the, of the, of the state. Uh, and the, you know, his point also is, this is part of a long pattern that has been going on in the Western world for at least a hundred years going back to the 1920s, where you have in the Weimar Constitution, a provision for suspension of the rule of law and government by state of exception, which, was, uh, and what's, which is what was then used by the, uh, the Hitler regime to govern, without, you know, to govern constitutionally, fully constitutionally, but outside the rule of law, as a, as law in the sense of laws passed by elected representatives. So I, I find this uh, the whole business now uh, very troubling, threatening, and I uh, would like it if we, if, there are const if our constitutional law experts were more uh, focused on the big picture question of what's going to be the future of liberty at all in America if we keep going under, with this current regimen. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you to Ilya, John, and John for all your hard work and comments on this. So we have a lot of questions. I thought we'd just dive right in, but um, 
But first, quickly, if anyone wants to respond at all, go at it. You don't have to, but okay. Um, let's open with this one. And we don't, everyone, of course, doesn't have to opine on each question, but uh, some will be better equipped or have these more ready to hand than others. Uh, one question from Ed, hasn't this shutdown been a takings under the Bill of Rights? I'll say, I mean, I'll, I'll say generally no. Uh, police power actions don't work the same as eminent domain does. Uh, if you really want to get into the, the analytical detail, this is one place where I think Ilya Soman has been very strong in his blogging at the Volok Conspiracy. Yeah, I, I, I did at one point explore uh, whether we should treat shut down businesses as if they were a fire break. You know, when there's a fire uh, coming close to town, sometimes the fire department will find it necessary to destroy a couple of houses at the front line in order to create a fire break to protect the rest. Uh, and my inclination was that that's a taking for a public good, uh, the common interest of the whole community, and it ought to be compensated. Oddly, oddly, the case law doesn't support that. Uh, and so the analogy to shutting down certain businesses to protect the rest uh, doesn't support it either. Uh, I think that's probably logically and, and legally flawed, but that's where the state of the law is on that question right now. We have this question from Doug, which is, um, it's, a, it's a long one, so bear with me, but it's interesting. Um, he asks, what does the important point about the legislature made by Professor Yu mean as a practical matter? Uh, he intimated that the legislature could terminate emergency authority without gubernatorial interference. Perhaps that's true in California, but in other states, isn't it the case that emergency authority of the governor, once it is vested, cannot be terminated by the legislature without the governor's consent, or at minimum, uh, you know, provide the opportunity for a veto requiring a supermajority override? Um, finally, in, in many other contexts, individual rights are, of course, not dependent on legislative recourse. Why should this area be different? Uh, just to clarify, I, it's up to each state constitution, of course, how they want to uh, structure their emergency powers. If, I haven't looked at all the states. The few states I've looked at, I found actually much more involvement by the legislature in emergencies than I had expected. I would have thought that they would uh, mimic the federal government where uh, the, uh, like the Congress has granted emergency powers to a president. They really don't have any provisions in them about how to undo the emergencies. I think a lot of states have uh, systems because they're allowed to structure their separation of powers as they like where the legislature can override these emergencies without, uh, without subject to the governor's veto which would be unconstitutional, I think, if it was applied at the federal level. Um, uh, but, you're, but you're also quite right. Uh, you know, individual liberties are not, uh, you know, they don't turn on and off during emergencies like the powers do. Um, but I think uh, John Eastman's point, I think, is correct that there's a lot more deference paid to courts uh, to the exercise of emergency power on individual liberties uh, overall and particularly at the beginning, I think the harder question is, will courts invigorate or, or sharpen their review over these emergency measures to get farther in time? Uh, they generally, as I, my sense is they don't. Uh, the doctrines don't sort of permit that. So that's why I say the solution is really the uh, solution of going through the, you know, the elected political process. I would yeah. say that the, meaning, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment uh, was meant to confirm the older Founders' understanding of the basic character, minimal, minimal, minimal character, and features of republican government—that is, uh, the due process of law and equal protection and privileges of citizens. Those three things essentially lay out what the government is supposed to do and how it should do it. Due process of law, in the, in the older sense, didn't just mean that. Well, the legislature decides to let the governor do whatever she wants forever. That was not due process of law. And uh, whatever exceptions were made uh, occasionally for this or that, uh, they were understood as exceptions and not part of the ordinary constitutional order, not really uh, part of. It's really only in the 20th century and uh, that you begin to get the idea that government should incorporate within itself the feature of triggering 
rule by emergency decree where everybody just goes along. And that's where we are now. We are so used to the idea of having the government ruled by delegated powers. John Eastman pointed this out earlier, quite rightly. Is we're so used to the idea of government delegating powers to somebody else, like an administrative agency, that gets to do largely, or maybe not largely, but a lot of what it just wants to. That's become a real, now a problem with regard to the entirety of all of our civil rights, where you, there, you have in the hands of these governors and local officials, the right to shut down the right and, and simply take away the right to life, liberty, and property, the three fundamental rights that were always mentioned in the founding. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna weigh in here as well because uh, it would be terrific if our legislators would step up and reclaim their legislative power to actually uh, actually uh, consider seriously the competing interests and competing risks and benefits on these policy judgments that are being made. They have for decades found it much easier to pass to pass the buck on that uh, and, and take credit. Well, we gave the governor the power to deal with this and all of the bad things that are happening, well, that was his doing or that was the EPA's doing or that was the CDC's doing, don't blame us. Um, so it would be nice if we were to have legislators uh, that redeveloped uh, some manliness <laughs> and stood up for their own legislative powers. Um, uh, we don't, alas. But it's also important, as Ilya pointed out, uh, that the courts have a role here. And it's not just in enforcing or protecting individual rights against draconian executive orders. It's enforcing structural limits on governmental power more broadly. Um, and we've developed a notion of the courts as only rights-based, protect individual rights, make up rights that we would then protect, whatever, and forgetting entirely about the, the, the beautiful structure uh, that is contained in our constitution and in the state constitutions that are designed to limit the authority of government. The courts have at least as important a role in policing uh, compliance with those structural limits on government as they do in, in, in enforcing the individual rights. And yet they have completely abdicated on that. And then finally, uh, I think it's extremely important if we're gonna get back to constitutional government that we have a people educated enough and to know what that constitutional government is and willing to insist on it among their elected officials, both, both on who they vote for when they go to the polls and the kind of um, petitions of government when, you know, that, that, that uh, a spirited people would engage in and used to engage in here when the government has crossed the lines of its authority. Uh, and that's a long-term project, you know, that, that Tom West and, and others of his colleagues up at Hillsdale uh, College are particularly, you know, uh, uh, devoted to, uh, but it, it seems critical because a, a, a people will no longer be able to govern themselves if they don't stand up to protect their liberties when they're being challenged in the way that they are right now. I want to jump in as well. This issue of the duration of emergency powers uh, at both the federal and state levels is leg legally and politically difficult. So the federal government, um, uh, we have the Uniform Emergencies Act, but that doesn't define emergency. Uh, and it basically gives the president the power to renew his emergency call. Um, it, it happened in the wake of Watergate when we were trying to codify what all the emergency statutes were. And so there's basically over a thousand triggers that once an emergency is invoked, all these other statutes are invoked. We, we went into this in the debate over the border wall funding. I mean, what, what's, what's interesting is that we have federally ongoing emergencies. You probably don't realize that we are still in a state of emergency from uh, the Iranian student takeover of uh, our embassy in Tehran. And also, from the fraud in the election in Belarus in 2006. Uh, so much of this is, um, uh, you know, what is an emergency and how long does it last? And that's even more accentuated at the state level where particularly for something like a pandemic, which isn't like, you know, a hurricane is short in duration. Most emergencies are short in duration, but here we're into month seven when does it end? Most states do have some sort of structural limits, even if the legislatures uh, are weak when they're uh, of the same party as the governor, at least, in taking back that power. You have um, <clears throat> sort of, uh, this uh, follow-up to a stru structural, this structural question, which is an interesting one uh, from Jennifer, and she asks, doesn't the federal government have an obligation 
to protect the constitutional rights of citizens when they're being infringed by state governments in the COVID context. Well, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a pretty strong advocate of uh, uh, broadly understanding the Republican Guarantee Clause. And, and that means that government is supposed to be by consent of the governed in the states. And the federal government has an obligation to guarantee that. What we've created here is uh, somewhat of a kingship uh, with, with, with uh, or, or, or worse, a despotism where the, the, uh, the, the single person at the top of the government, the governor or an unelected public health official is deciding things without the input of the popular gov the citizenry. Um, but uh, uh, in 150 years, there's only been one case that was settled favorably on Republican Guarantee Clause claims. It happened to be one we brought nearly 20 years ago now, but uh, uh, it's largely been considered a non-justiciable clause in the Constitution, meaning the courts will stay out of it. And if the federal government doesn't seek to do anything, there's not much one can do. There's also Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, where, which is why the Justice Department, uh, this Justice Department has gone into some states to protect uh, rights of religious liberty, Second Amendment, other, other issues. Um, I mean, there's a fight about which rights the 14th Amendment exactly protects, but I, I do think that the federal government does have the power to come in uh, and not wait for a lawsuit by that citizen if uh, their rights are being infringed by the state. Yeah, I think that the whole point of the 14th, uh, aside from the Republican Guarantee Clause, the 14th was meant to be more, you know, clarify what's the federal authority over the state governments when they don't give, when there's some problem at the Republican government. And you have their uh, equal protection of the laws. The idea that there's being, that there's actually any sense of equal protection at this point is, is absurd. Left-wing demonstrators are fine, right-wing demonstrators are, 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 to be, are to be arrested. I mean, this is basically the, the policy not always acted upon in every state that's doing this. You have, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, abortion and marijuana are essential businesses and gyms and churches, you know, physical health and spiritual health are non-essential businesses. You know, what does that tell you about the character of, of our current leadership, what they want, and also their, this denial of basic constitutional procedure, similarly with due process. How do you have due process of law when there's no law? You simply decrees that uh, out, out, you know, that's that are uncon that are that are in the case of Michigan at least unconstitutional decrees. There's no emergency power in the state constitution, and the feds could sure they could step in. Look, in reality, we this idea we have a constitution that's actually functioning and that and that people believe in. No. It's all very selective. Some parts of it we think is are right and, and, and therefore should be followed. Other parts we ignore. That's the bottom line on it. So, and so I, I think that's why John Eastman's right. In the end, it all it has to, it goes back to the character of the people. If they're not willing to step up and, as Washington used to say, you know, exercise their vigilance against government's abuse of its powers. Madison in 57, Federalist 57 says the same thing, right? You have to stand up. You have to be. You have to have manly vigilance to step up and control, out of out of control governmental institutions, whether at the state or federal. And if you don't have that, then you can't have constitutional government. I want to pick up on that issue about equal protection in response to one of the other questions that's that's come in. The emergency has crushed small businesses, uh, but big box stores were apparently allowed to continue to operate. What we've seen in a number of instances is the selective uh, application of these shutdown orders that benefits certain uh, businesses to the expense of others. In Florida, for example, there was a, a governor's commission to set up how we're going to deal with um, the hospitality industry. And he created a commission. The commission had all of the big resort representatives on it, but, but, but prohibited people with uh, Airbnb or, or vacations rental by owner, the home uh, thing from having any stay on the commission. Not a surprise, the commission came out with a recommendation which the governor accepted to allow the resorts to open, but not to allow Airbnbs to open. Now this kind of rent seeking, uh, you know, goes to the heart <laughs> of, 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 of an equal protection violation. And it seems to me we need a little more teeth in our, uh, in our litigation analysis to be able to get through that kind of pretextual 
selective application of the orders to benefit people that are donating to the governors or the legislatures and not those others. These are the kind of things that a judiciary is supposed to be able to, to deal with and to distinguish, and yet they've abdicated. Wanted to uh, careful, John. John, you going to accuse you of Lochnering here. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to combine two questions. Um, one from Helen, who is a 2020 Publius Fellow, a friend of the Institute, and she, she asks of, of Tom West, what is not exactly a legal question, but kind of a moral and ethical, small r Republican question. What does it say about the American people that so many citizens have not only complied, but become like little commissars policing each other's compliance? When did Americans, the people, not the politicians, become totalitarians? And then Mike's, Mike asks, and it's kind of related, um, as the American people have so thoroughly acquiesced to the shutdown and a myriad of other mandates of questionable constitutionality, to say the least, what hope is there for recovering Republican government and the principles of the founding? Yeah, that's, that's my question, too. It's, you have to wonder uh, if, if people are willing to put up with uh, it's, it's Madison and Federal 57. If people will put up with this sort of thing, they'll put up with anything, including the, the, the loss of constitutional government. That's basically why I quoted Agamben. Agamben's looking at the big picture of European developments over the past century and saying, Europe has just gotten used to the idea of rule by state of exception, uh, emergency decree. We, we, that's our world now. We just live in that world. And until now, that I think can change for this in the same way it happened in the American Revolution. When people get sufficiently upset because it affects their personal lives enough, that they recognize that this is not just a matter of temporary this or that. It, this is, they want to change our life and make it the new normal for us to be subjected to arbitrary decrees from people that the legislatures then go along with. That has to happen. If that won't happen, then you can't. And I think that's the that's the point Helen's making about the character of the people is if, if the people are too sheep-like and too, uh, and then too, too uh, you know, if, if, we, if we turn into a, a, a nation of sheep in which we're all being Karens towards each other, you can't have freedom. You know, it, it, Tocqueville said Americans used to turn each other in when they committed crimes against person and property. Yeah, sure. Americans have always been willing to help the police in that way. Uh, but now when you have these crimes of, you know, his mask was below his nose and uh, you know, I saw people kissing because that wasn't social distance. You can't, have a, you can't have a free society. I saw people at a political meeting together. They were probably talking about, you know, winning an election. We can't have that. Now, if people can't figure out that's a problem for us and, and to make their politics. And why can't, and John's right, the judiciary is, should be doing something. But my point is, so should the legislature, so should the executive. All branches of government should be pro-liberty. I want to, um, we could maybe end with a more legal question, but I just wanted to let everyone know that um, if we didn't get to yours, there are a bunch of them. Uh, you can email my public email at ryanwilliams at claremont.org and uh, we'll do our best to field these for the next day and see if people want to answer. And then at a certain point we have to, we can't take endless questions. So we'll, we'll cut it off after a day and a half or so. But if you want to, have it answered, I can do my best to uh, send it around. Um, and then I, I wanted to answer um, Michael's myself uh, without throwing it to the panel. He asks if Christy Noem is kind of the model for handling this. Uh, she, she did wonderfully well. Um, she's in a very small state though. I think uh, uh, Ron DeSantis in the third largest state in the union has been a, a model uh, of a large state. Um, uh, he's made some mistakes, but has done quite well. Let's, has anyone read um, this Pennsylvania decision from Judge Stickman? Uh, Bill asks, uh, they, the academic arguments haven't really persuaded judges. They always invoke Jacobson and Prince v. Mass. Has anyone read this Pennsylvania decision and what do you all think of it? Uh, I, I, yeah, this is John. I, I think it's a terrific decision. It's 66 pages. I've not gotten through the whole thing yet. Uh, but he basically says the governor's order there violates the First Amendment's freedom of assembly, uh, but also due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. And I think he's right about that. And I think uh, I've not looked at how he's dealt with the emergency powers and Jacobson, um, but I suspect he's probably taken the line we've articulated here. 
that at some point emergency powers are no longer viable exercises of political power if we're going to be consistent with constitutional government. Um, and, uh, you know, when the emergency passes, in other words, the imminence that needed the, the immediate response passes and you've got the time for the legislature to weigh in, then the only things that are appropriate or valid are legislative uh, judgments, statutes, uh, not executive decrees. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it's a 66 page uh, decision by a, a fairly new judge and uh, I, I commend it to everybody's attention. Uh, I, I uh, read the decision too. I just skimmed it quickly. Uh, I agree with half of it, but I think half of it will likely get overruled. So the half I think was correct is that uh, certain restrictions in Pennsylvania, which is my home state, uh, my mom still lives there, so I hear all about what's going on over there. Pennsylvania for a long time restricted church services. It still ha it had restrictions on uh, political protests. Uh, but then they allow Black Lives Matter protests. And so I think the court rightly found that the way the state was administering uh, the lockdown with regard to these uh, specific rights that are in the First Amendment was unconstitutional. I think the part that's likely to get overruled is that he then said, as John mentioned, that there's a right under the uh, Due Process Clause. Uh, and this is, it, he says this, it doesn't call it a natural right, because it's a right to essentially make a living, uh, economic right. And then he said it was subject to intermediate, you know, intermediate scrutiny for those who don't want to get too bored, but there's strict scrutiny for the, you know, the most important rights and then rational basis for economic regulation. And he said it was subject to, to intermediate scrutiny, which is inconsistent with the doctrine right now, right? The intermediate scrutiny is, uh, I think, is generally reserved for um, uh, rules that affect, uh, government rules that affect gender, I think, is the most important intermediate scrutiny. He essentially changed, right, the level of scrutiny uh, from rational basis up, and I would think he's either going to get overruled or that case will go to the Supreme Court. I think all rights are important and equal, and no rights are more equal than others. But that's a separate discussion. Thank you. Well, we we can actually uh, we do have two minutes, so let's take this quickly. It's something very close, I know, to Ilya's heart and John's and and others, and it's from Brandon. Um, it seems like a lot of the controversy regarding the ability of the government to regulate commercial activity, right to contract, pursue an application, et cetera, comes down to the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment that Ilya mentioned. Can the freedom of association that West talked about do all the work in protecting people's liberty, or is it necessary to, to revisit and revive privileges and immunities? Well, I have a law review article that came out less than a year ago called the Once in Future Privileges or Immunities Clause um, in the wake of McDonald versus City of Chicago, which extended the right to keep and bear arms to the states in, in 2010. The key fifth vote was provided by Justice Thomas, who did not agree with the substantive due process analysis of the plurality led by Justice Alito and talked about the privileges or immunities clause, not to be confused, uh, that's the 14th Amendment, not to be confused with the privileges and immunities clause of Article 4. Um, and I do think that you have to have a substantive theory of rights as protected by that 14th Amendment. Uh, perhaps less important uh, at the end of the day which clause you use, but it's more constitutionally faithful uh, to use privileges or immunities, which was meant to protect most of the substantive rights that the 14th Amendment's enactors uh, understood. Um, you know, due process of law has some substance. A, a well-functioning kangaroo court still deprives you of the due process of law. Uh, but most of what we talk about in terms of rights, whether enumerated or unenumerated, uh, and by the way, those enactors could have just said the first eight amendments are hereby applied to the states. They had that English language capacity, but they didn't. And, uh, and so the, the 14th Amendment protects both more and less than the Bill of Rights on top of the various unenumerated rights, which we can debate uh, what exactly is covered there. But I think absolutely uh, all of those background freedoms, I like to invoke my right to walk down the left side of a street wearing a green hat. It's a very important right. And the government, whether in a pandemic or not, doesn't have, shouldn't have the power to restrict that willy nilly. Yeah, I'm completely in agreement with Ilya's 14th Amendment point. It's, it's, uh, I think that would be, it's the basis on which the states are not following the federal constitution in this current lockdown, in my opinion. I think that's true. Uh, 
good. And it, it's particularly important that the, the, the things that were clearly talked about and, and that the drafters and the ratifiers of that amendment intended were things like the right to keep and bear arms. That was explicit because it was adopted in large part because the Southern former slave owners were um, uh, committing violent acts against their former slaves, uh, the right to earn a living, and the right to engage in contracts. The notion that those economic liberties or that Second Amendment right is somehow less protected uh, than the right to freedom of speech is, is bizarre as an original matter any, for anyone that has looked at those debates. All right, well, we've come to the end of our, our first panel. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Tom, John, and John and Ilya for, for joining us uh, during a weekday to do this on, on Constitution Day. And uh, for those of you who haven't signed up for, um, we're having another panel here at 11.30 Pacific time, and uh, it's gonna be on election fraud and the Constitution uh, with another set of distinguished panelists. And uh, if you if you want info for that and you don't have it, just go to claremont.org slash events and you'll see the Constitution Day uh, event button there and you can sign up for it. But thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Constitution Day. <laughs>